All right, let's begin. So, uh, we're going to go through the mechanical uh, vibration problem. There's some right here. So these are from the class final, so this will show you what level you would be tested at. Uh, so we're going to get through these guys, and hopefully by the end you will understand it. So it's just an application of second order differential equations, so once you know how to set it up, it should actually be no problem to finish solving it. Those are the dates. <laughs> yeah, these <laughs> kids freaking out. Oh my god, I can go back and get it. It's freaking out. Okay, uh, last time what we saw was a model for a spring mass system. We can model by a second order different. Position y equals zero. 
set up an initial value problem uh, for the position y of t, the spring has been stretched down another six inches and released. So we're going to set this up and we're going to solve it, even though we don't have to solve it. Um, so, uh, go, what do you think we uh, need to do? Right, m equals weight, or gravity, because we know weight equals mass times gravity because weight is a force. Uh, so, it's over 32 because it's in feet. Uh, gravity, we're considering positive because the downward is positive direction. So, that's 1 over 16. And then L is in feet and a half for a second square. L is a half feet. L? Yeah. Okay, so what does that mean? Yeah. You can use the spring constant, so how do you find that? F is negative K, K is plus one. Okay, so what is the F in this situation? Is it negative K? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and uh, I mean, K is always considered positive, so you don't have to worry about it too much. Uh, so what is the force that's stretching the thing? Well, two pounds. Two pounds. And how far Six. does it stretch it? Six inches. Six inches. So We're using feet, feet here, so I would translate that half. to feet. So it's one half. Uh, Do we have to know the conversion between feet and? Yes. Uh, uh, feet don't. So <laughs> six inches in feet. Come on, huh? <laughs> no. I'm saying we have to know the conversion. Yes. Uh, you need. To, so that's one of the things I can sneak up on you here. Units are going to be important. And you tend to want to make your units coincide with the uh, units you're using gravity for. Would you make an exception? Uh, no, I mean inches, <laughs> inches which is pretty it's hard. Hard. It's, not, it's not so bad. <laughs> so they're they're twelve <laughs> inches and a foot. So k equals four. Our m equals six, one over sixteen. Now, remember what I said, what is gamma? Here? Zero. Unless otherwise stated, we will assume gamma is zero. Assume no damping. This is kind of like a ignore air resistance kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, does the negative on f equals negative k disappear because of the direction? You can kind of ignore it. K is always going to be positive for us. Why, why we, we really needed that negative to derive that formula. That's why it was important. I cannot actually ignore it in practice. The spring constant is always considered a positive number. Okay, so that leads us to what's the equation now? This means 1 over 16 y double prime uh, plus 0 y prime plus y equals 0, where y of 0 equals, y prime of 0 equals, what's y of 0? A half? It's uh, 0, right? Oh yeah, it's 0. Starting, in, starting still, you're releasing the initial velocity is 0. Uh, it's going to be a half here. So, when they told you that the two pound weight stretches the spring to position zero, they're talking about y equals zero's equilibrium. But then it says the spring has been stretched down another six inches and released. Which means we have that. Whenever you release something, you don't actually give it any velocity, you just let it go. You know it's because it's released. So it's pulled down. Six inches before being released. And that's it. Okay, let's solve this one. How would we solve that? One over six substitution r squared. You mean substitution? Uh, r squared plus, plus four equals zero. Uh, R squared plus sixty plus sixty four plus or minus eight. Which 
is a i. Huh? A i. A i. This means that our y equals uh, c one e to the negative a t. Oh, sorry. E to the hold on. C was cosine a t.
it's similar enough to the first one that I yeah, want to do it. Uh, spring 06. Yes. It's the convention that downwards is case positive? Yes, for these problems, specifically. Uh, so a mass with m equals 2 is connected to a spring with spring constant. So they're just giving us the values here. Uh, damping is such that when the mass is traveling at a velocity of 1 feet foot per second, the resistance is 4 pounds. Suppose the mass starts in equilibrium position with a downward velocity of 3 feet per second. Okay, find the general solution is the first step. So we're actually told some things right off the bat. Uh, we're given m and we're given k. m is 2, k is 4. Now we are told about resistance, which means we can find the gamma. How can we find gamma? Gamma was just the, we assume that the force is proportional to the velocity experienced by the system, so it's a constant times velocity, and so we can solve for the constant that way. And so here it says the velocity is 1, and the force experienced is 4. So gamma is going to be 4. This means we have 2, did they call this y or anything? Let's, let's see. 2u double prime uh, plus 4u prime plus 4u equals zero. You know external force is mentioned, so that's what we're going to <laughs> go with. The initial conditions. The initial conditions. U of zero. Zero. Zero, because that says it says equilibrium. The mass starts in its equilibrium position with a downward velocity of 3. So what does that mean for us? U prime of u plus 3. Equals 3. Remember, downwards is our positive direction for this setup. OK, so now we're going to find the general solution. Can divide by 2. Can divide by 2. So our characteristic equation is going to be r squared plus 2 r plus 2. two. And quadratic formula. Um, minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a so minus 1 plus or minus it's going to be i? No. Yes. Negative 1. Yes. This means our y is going to look like e to the negative t. C1 e to the minus t cosine, cosine t. t c e to the minus t sine t and now we want to find the initial condition c1 and c2. I will have 
minus C1, well, I know C1 is 0, so that's going to go away. So I would have C2. That was easy. So this means that our U is going to be 3 Now that one is a bit more realistic, right? So that's like a sine function, but it's being damped by the e to the minus t. Uh, so eventually it's going to hit zero. Yeah, yeah. So you look at like e to the minus t versus minus e to the minus t for when the sine hits a negative. That is just going to look like so just porn, 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 porn. <laughs> okay, so that's what it uh, kind of looks like. Uh, that was part one. Part two. After one second, if you held your hand two feet below the weight's starting position, would the weight eventually hit your hand? How would you figure that out? Set, uh, Set u of 1 equals 2. This means uh, we would have 3 e to the minus 1 sine of 1 equals 2. Um, you can estimate the Well, first we find find u of one. Um, that is actually going to be a little less than two. Okay. Yeah, because you kind of have to estimate here. E's. E is like two point seven. So 3 over 2.7 times something that's less than 1, sine of 1, is less than 1, because we know that sine of pi over 2 is 1. So that'll give us, I don't know, what is that, 0 0.7, 0 0.8? Isn't 3 over e a little bit more than 1? Yes. And I'm pretty sure that's less than 2. And for sure, if we, once we hit 2 seconds, that's going to be for sure less than 2. Yeah, maybe it's going back up to 2 seconds. Huh? Well, I mean, it's not asking about 2 seconds. We don't really care about that time. Well, we care about after. So there comes a point where we hit 1 second, which is around here. So the idea is, if you never actually attain 2 at that point, you will never attain 2 ever. Right? Because it says eventually that you're in. Yeah, so it'll... I'm pretty sure that's less than 2. I think I actually put that in the top there. But it, it's not exactly totally clear. If they, yeah, if, if the question would have been better if they asked after two seconds, then you, there would be no, uh, no idea. Really? Huh? Five or two seconds. Because then this would be less than one, and the maximum that sine would hit is one, so it would be clear that this thing has overall would be less than one. So that would be clear. But uh, here, I think that's what it is. So no, one turn.
do we know that? How do we know it's not like on the left side of the curve going up after one cycle? It'll be backwards in time. Mm -hmm. So if it says there's no left side of the curve, there's only the right side. No, what I'm saying is like, what if uh, the amplitude is on the rise after you have one? So finish off that. Piece. Oh, it's definitely not going to be on the rise. I know this is the. The amplitude is never going to get larger, it's always getting smaller. You see where you put the dot for the one second, it continues to go up and might hit two. Yeah, like how do, you, how do you know where that peak is? Oh, look, I, this is supposed to be less. You cut the u of pi over 2. What? That would, that would be that, that like local mass. Yeah, I'm not going to know exactly what that is, but I know that I, that's going to be less than 2. Can you just not two. give us this question? <laughs> <laughs> Well, if I was going to give it a question, I would give it a, a nicer t value than that. I probably wouldn't answer a question like that. Thank you. Uh, Same that now. Let's look. <laughs> yeah, you never know when I'm writing the second. No. You guys are the ones that stuck around. <laughs>
y is going to be c1, e to the minus 4t, cosine of 4 radical 3t plus c2, e to the minus 4t, sine of radical 3, 4. So the nice thing about these is that the sign will always, when you plug in t equals zero, those guys always go away. So it's always easier to find the, the constants here. So we need to find the derivative. Zero equals C zero. That would be C one. C one. Y prime of zero is equal to four. So all the C one parts are going to go to zero, and the sine parts are going to go to zero. So that's going to be. <laughs> By the way, I'm sure some of you know this, but that's kind of how you know you've studied enough. Like most people don't realize when to stop studying. They get one question right and they feel so happy and they just put the book down. It's not how you know you've done studying. See, see what happens? People, they, they would do a bunch of problems, right? These kids who like work really hard, one of the reasons why it doesn't work out for them. They work really hard, you try to figure something out, like, oh man, I got it wrong, and then you know, they try another one, and uh, what did Javon do? Okay, uh, what did the textbook do again? Uh, so they get like the problem wrong a bunch of times, and it's really frustrating. So the first time they get it right, oh yes, duh, I understand. And then they close the book, and then they go away. Like, Dude, you just practiced failing. 19 out of 20 times. You got it right one time. You're not done. Your brain knows how to fail more than it knows how to succeed. <laughs> like, you're good at failing. So when you're under stress, what do you think your brain is going to default to? The thing that you practice more, right? No, you keep going until you're getting it right so often that you're bored while getting it right. Now you know I'm ready. Right? So at this point, it's like, Yeah, I think I can move on to the next topic now. Let's talk about uh, chapter 4. <laughs> Let's talk about the higher order of linear O's of the Nice thing about this is when we're doing second order stuff, I proved a lot of the things in end order. So we've covered a lot of the theory here. Um, 
But there are some honorable mentions. Uh, yes. yes. Uh, on the screen, uh, problems, homages? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, if they're not, you will be specifically told what the function is, and then it's just a matter of doing the non homogeneous case of this, uh, which you know I call it. But I mean, uh, I, I'd probably give you the homogeneous case. Because I would ch test you on non homogeneous second orders in some other problem for sure. So I'm not going to do overkill. So. Also, there are some other things like critical damping and over damping and quasi periods. Like I'm not going like, to. I'm going to ask you something like this. When you know how to do that, I'm happy. Highlights. So an nth order. Linear ODE has the form y to the nth derivative plus so p1 of t y to the n minus 1 plus p2 of t y to the n minus 2 plus p n of t times y. Zero identically, we call it homogeneous. And we know by the existence and uniqueness theorem, given a set of initial conditions, we can find a unique solution that satisfies these conditions on any interval where the coefficients are continuous. So as long as we're looking at an interval where uh, the coefficients are continuous, the p i is and the g, are continuous, uh, we will be able to find uh, an n times differentiable, at least, solution of that form uh, such that uh, the wrong skin of the y1s to the yn is not going to be zero. So this is what we call a fundamental set of solutions, so we kind of looked at that already. We also have Hobble's theorem works in higher orders as well. Hobble. Hobble's. Yes. Also, we have Hobble's theorem. They see that says the Ronskin will be a constant times e to the integral of. It turns out the integral is always of the coefficient of the second to highest derivative. So this is going to be the p1. Is it negative p1? Uh, was it? Yeah, it was negative p1. Yes, it was negative p1. Because you actually do the same thing we did. You'd set it up, it would look like the Ronskin prime w prime plus w equals zero, and you would get that. So that would be the form of the wrong skin. Uh, what else did we cover that you should know at this point? Variation of parameters still works.
we actually derive this for the nth order case. We know that the y p is going to be given by y1 times integral of w1 over w plus y2 times integral of w2 over w plus y n times integral of w n over w, where w sub i is the Lonskian with the ith column replaced by zero zero g. So when we were doing variation parameters before, the yes. formula you gave us was negative y one. Yes. So is that not the case for um, n order? No, that actually works out uh, in second order. In second order, in order case, you had that the uh, the y p was given by y one times integral of Ronskin one over w plus y two integral of Ronskin two over w. Uh, this basically is this is y one y one prime. But we replace this with zero g y two y two prime over the Ronskin plus y2 times y1, y1 prime, 0, g, or the wrong skin. Now this, you have this times this, minus that times that, so the minus comes out here, and you have the y2 times g, or w. Here you have this times this, which is positive, minus 0, so that's y1, g, so this negative sign actually came from the plus. Right, so then does that mean for higher order differential equations, there's going to be a negative sign for every other term in your particular solution? So you have like negative y1, the integral of g times y2 over w. Uh, no, I wouldn't assume that. It would depend on the functions. So you so need to solve the wrong you had a higher order yeah. so If you have a higher order, it's going to be like a 3x3 three three or 4x4. Four four. A lot of things can happen with all of those. Right, okay. Can you only find so, the round skin of uh, square? Yeah. Never rectangular? <coughs> the round skin is going to set up with a square because you're taking the n solutions and you're differentiating n times, n minus 1 times. Uh, so that's why this formula ended up having the negative here. It came from applying this formula. And parenthetical state. Okay. How do you solve a determinant of a 4x4 four four matrix? Laplace in expansion, probably. So we have the way to go. Yeah, you can just use the row the column and then mm -hmm. use the smaller square. Uh, okay. okay. <laughs> I'll pretend like I know what you're talking about. Okay. <laughs> You probably are going to do that in 346 soon. I'm surprised you haven't done it already. Yeah, we haven't been turned You told us you were going to show us how to solve an nth degree polynomial. Yes, I'm trying to get to it. All right. I'm trying to get to it, yes. But yes, larger determinants. OK. For you, I would never actually ask you a fourth word one. Uh, but at least I won't ask you to find the wrong scale. Let's uh, continue. Also, now we're going to focus on constant coefficients. We will be dealing with non-constant coefficients, but we always start out with a constant case. These are nicer. And we're assuming that our n is greater than our equal 3 because we know how to deal with n equals 2 already. Uh, so. As it turns out, the same assumption applies. We're going to assume y looks like e to the rt, because again, all the derivatives would be self-similar because all the coefficients are constants, and you will obtain. characteristic equation that 
that basically it's going to look like uh, r to the n plus uh, some constant r to the n minus 1 plus another constant r to the n minus 2 plus pn equals 0, where the, the pi's are constants. pi's are the constant coefficients. Nothing attached to the r to the n. Well, not for the form I wrote down. I wrote down like y to the end, there was a 1 in front of it, so. Okay. But yes, if there was something in front of that, you know, it would be here. Um, so, we need to know how to find the roots of n order polynomials.
R squared minus 3 squared. times what? Yeah. The th think of this as if we were another variable. Like if you had, uh, say, x squared minus 2x minus 3, you would factor that into x oh. minus 3 times x minus 3. Oh. I'm thinking of it as a quadratic, right? You, so I bring the squares with me, but in my mind, it's just a single variable. Is there a way you could like still brute force it through like matrices or something? Yeah, but why would you? Because I don't think like that. This is just a situation you might find yourself in. It might look like a higher order, but you can think of it as uh, something lower. Now, one pattern is with quadratics. So once you have the powers are, there's a, a zero power here, there's a power here, and the next power is double the previous power, you can do this trick. So it could also work with r to the 6, r cubed. It could also work with r to the 16, r to the 8th. could also work with a, a bunch of different things. Okay. So this would mean from here we can actually solve your r is going to be plus or minus radical 3 here. I plus or minus I. Plus or minus I. Plus or minus I. So what would the general solution to this be? So, there are things that you have learned in pre-call, special factories. So, this means like things like, uh, yes, difference of squares, <laughs> difference of cubes, sum of cubes, etc. Did I also put, I didn't put, Pascal triangle is, an, is another category. But basically, you should remember things like uh, a squared minus b squared, factors into a minus b times a plus b. You should remember that a cubed minus b cubed factors into a minus b times a squared plus a b plus b squared. You needed that on the bonus for the, on the yeah. test, by the way. Uh, <laughs> if, you, if you don't realize that, then you probably didn't get it right. Um, <laughs> although there, there, was, there was another way to do it. Remember there was a, a y triple prime plus y? Oh, yeah. right? that, that resulted in an r cube plus 1. What you, the trick was to think of that as r cube plus 1 cubed and apply this one. Uh, where, where I'm at, I actually chose this as an example, and I'm going to show you actually two ways to do uh, this guy. Yeah, so things like that you should know. So, for example, this was one, on one of the versions of test one, this was the bonus y triple prime plus y equals zero. Uh, another example, y to the fourth minus 16y equals zero. And another example, yeah, grouping also, I put it in this category. <laughs> hint, hint. So this is triple prime minus 2y double prime minus y prime plus 2y equals 0. <laughs> Remember the pre-cop bringing on the sneezes. 
in the dust out. <laughs> <laughs> get to the roots of the unity thing, I don't know if I'm going to get to that. That was pretty cool, but... Yes, we'll have to wait till next time. Okay, so, you have y equals the prime plus y equals zero. This gives us a characteristic equation r t plus one equals zero. This is going to be r plus one times r squared uh, minus r plus one. Next time I'll show you another way to do this, that's pretty cool. Uh, so, this means r is going to be minus 1, or that one's not going to factor, so use quadratic formula, uh, minus b plus minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. So that's going to be 1 half plus or minus radical 3 over 2i. So, your y in this case is going to be c1 e to the minus t plus c2 e to the t over 2 cosine radical 4 to t plus c3 e to the t over 2 sine radical 0 to t. How do they figure out the quadratic formula? Huh? How do they figure out the quadratic formula? What do you mean figure out the quadratic formula? Like they uh, realize that this algorithm would solve the roots for any polynomial. Like oh, completing the square. And that's how they're like. That's, that's how you figure out. If you look at this, solve that by completing the square, you get the quadratic form. And then how they figure out for the third, fourth, or fifth? Huh? Not the fifth, but like the third and fourth degree polynomial. Oh, that's, that's much more complicated. <laughs> like, it's huge. You, you, you won't, it's, it's a huge formula. The third one is a huge. And you have a, uh, you have a lot of patterns that consider it. But uh, that, it's actually been known for a long time, though. Let's see the other example. This means r to the fourth minus 16 equals zero. Uh, how do we do with that one? r squared plus minus four squared. That was a uh, difference of squares that I just applied.
r equals 2, r equals 1, r equals minus 1. This means that our solution looks like c1 e to the tt plus c2 e to the t plus c3 and e to the t. Three linearly independent solutions. Algebra. <laughs> yes, algebra class, yeah. Pre-calc. Another special thing you need to notice. What number are we three? Uh, binomial expansions. Many ways you can do this. Uh, if you've taken combinatorics, you can look at this in terms of combinations. But probably a nicer way is Pascal's triangle. Remember what that is? Yeah, one, one, one. So it starts out with uh, three ones in a triangle, and then one, you add the two middle ones, you get two, one, one, add these two, you get three, add those two, you get three, one, one, four, six, four, one, one, five, ten, ten, five, one, etc. Right? You just start building down this triangle. The nice thing about that triangle is is that it tells you the coefficients in a binomial expansion. Binomial means two, bi means two. So, what you'll realize is that, you look at this triangle, one, 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 two, one, one, three, three, one, one, four, six, four, one. Basically what that reminds you of, you'll notice this one here, for example, if I were to take a plus b squared, you know that's a squared plus 2ab plus b squared, right? Yeah. I want you to notice that the coefficients are 1, 2, 1. Oh. <laughs> if, you, if you come here, a plus b cubed, it turns out that that's going to be a cubed plus 3a squared b plus 3ab squared plus b cubed. I want you to take a moment to notice that's 1, 3, 3, 1. Uh, what happens is you start with one variable at the highest power and then count down. a cubed, a squared, a, a to the 0. And you go backwards with the other variable. b cubed, b squared, b, b to the 0. So you count down with the powers of one variable while counting up with the power of another variable. And Pascal's triangle tells you what the coefficients are. So now, you have a plus b to the fourth, what's that going to look like? a to the fourth power plus 4ab plus 6a squared b squared plus 4ab cubed plus b to the fourth. Right. <laughs> and you can keep going down. Right? <laughs> I do this in my pre-call class, kids freak out. Because <laughs> they're like, oh, I have to put all these parentheses and multiply out. I'm like, oh, no, it's just going to do this. And, How does he do that? <laughs> like magic kids, when you, when you, <laughs> one day when you're old enough, we'll give you the secrets. And, oh, my God, it's weird. <laughs> you, know, you just keep them in suspense. You never actually tell them. Yeah. Eventually, you're like, someone is going to tell them. Right? <laughs> huh? So Pascal's triangle, one of those magic mathy thingies that are used for one just this. A lot of things are like that. Yeah. Another way, if you have combinations, is that uh, if you look at something like a plus b to the n, you can think of this as n choose 0, a to the n plus n choose 1, a to the n minus 1, b plus n choose 2, a to the n minus 2 b squared plus all the way down to n choose n b to the n. But what are you choosing? So this is a shortcut for n factorial over uh, 2 factorial times n minus 2 factorial. This is a shortcut. You've never seen before, don't, don't worry about it. In statistics, that. they say n choose oh. negative numbers is like zero. How does that make sense? Like in some statistics, they're like n choose a negative number. Yes, yeah, one. 
you have entries that are negative? Yeah. And they're like, it's a zero, or it's like, other people say it's like negative stuff. For which class? Like stats 311. It's for like... I didn't realize. They, they use the gamma function to generalize the factorial. Yeah. Right. You, which you need to know like some complex analysis for that. I didn't know they did that. Oh, so did you uh, but yeah, you can generalize what it means to be a negative factorial. You can generalize the factorial on all the real numbers. Um, so it's not only some that's for integers. And yeah, with that, you can just follow that formula. Let's, let's also say you can take that. Which, by the way, that would be how, for example, you would uh, expand the radical. Right? You get a plus b to the one half. What does that actually expand into? You're going to have to be able to compute one half factorial, and it turns out that gives you an infinite number of terms. So all those students who think that the square root of a plus b is the square root of a plus the square root of b, you're infinitely wrong. <laughs> it's like you, you miss like everything. Okay. Uh, yeah. So an example where you use that. Expanded, but the fact that the signs are alternating means that the b is going to be negative. So this just factors all into r minus 1 all q. So you have r, you have a repeated root of 1. Now how do you deal with the repeated root? The same with yours. So you can apply reduction of order, and ultimately you will obtain that to make everyone linearly independent. You just multiply by t's. So that's e to the t plus c to the t, e to the t plus c3 t squared, e to the t, and that's it. That's how we do it. I mean, we'll stop there, but you can probably look this up. I mean, stay tuned next time. I'm going to, you should probably look this up if you don't remember. Long division of polynomials. not that simple. Like if this was uh, z to the fourth, take the nth root to get a plus or minus one. What are the other two answers? Turns out there's also a plus or minus i. How would you know that by taking the nth root? So I'm going to tell you how you figure that out. How to figure out all the roots.